Hey everyone, welcome back. This is the final video in geometric sequences and series. Today we're going to look at section 1.5. We're going to peer into the infinites. Whoa! It's going to be crazy. Actually, it's not going to be that crazy, but whatever. Just pretend it's exciting. All right. Now, in section 1.5, you're going to get a nice little story in your textbook about Zeno's paradox. And really, this is just the question, is it possible to cross the street? And I know you're thinking to yourself, hey, I, I crossed the street before, so, so yeah, it is possible. Well, Zeno's paradox sets up a really neat story. He, he, he says, wait a minute, is it possible? To cross the street, you have to first off cross one half of the street, right? Then you have to cross half of what's left. That, that's a quarter of the street. Then you have to cross an eighth of what of the street, half of what's left of that. And then you have to cross half of what's left of the street, and so on and so forth. Well, after five, four halves of, of this, well, we haven't quite gotten there yet. Well, after five steps, we haven't gotten there. After six stages, we haven't gotten there. Seven, eight, nine. There's always a little bit of the street that's left to be crossed. In fact, the only way we're going to finally cross the street is if we could cross all infinitely many of these subdivisions that we've created. And since it's impossible to do infinitely many things, it's impossible to cross the street. And yet, people have crossed the street before. So what we've in fact seen from Zeno's paradox is that it is possible to do infinitely many things as long as they're really, really small. So let's look at a first example here and think about it. Example one says that you save $128 in the first month. In the second month, you're gonna save half of that amount, so $64, then half of that amount, $32, and then half of that, and half of that, and half of that, and so on and so forth, month after month after month. Well, how much will you have saved over time? Well, two months is gonna be $128 plus another $64, and so we'll have saved uh, $192 after two months. Well, I could keep adding plus 32, plus 16, et cetera, et cetera, or I could use this summation formula. Why don't you use the summation formula and figure out how much you will have saved after five months, 10 months, 20 months, and 30 months. I'll pause the video now and let you fill it in. All right, plugging your formula in, I get this, after five months, $248, after 10 months, $255.75, 20 months, we don't gain very much between 10 and 20, $255.999, after 30 months, $255.999998, in fact, if you keep going, you're just going to get a lot of nines, okay, well, what's happening here? Well, we're getting closer and closer to 256, okay, so let's fill in below, notice that the more terms we add 1 minus r to the power of n gets really really close to the number 1 okay so as n gets larger sn in this case approaches $256 you know try n equals a thousand months and you'll get really close to 256 and so we say that the series converges to $256. Now the next question here that we might ask is, does this always happen? Does every infinite series approach some limit? And the answer is no. We could imagine, say, adding $2, then $4, then $8, then $16, and so on. To an account. As time gets for, forward here, you just keep adding more and more and more and more. And there's no limit to the total in the account. Okay, we have a name for this. We call this, oops, we call this divergent. Something's convergent when it approaches a value, like the 256 above, and something is divergent, like in this example, when it keeps going off and on to infinity and never stops. There's a law of convergence, in fact. 
Let's read it carefully. For a geometric series, if the absolute value of r is less than 1, in other words, r is between minus 1 and 1, then as n gets bigger and bigger, r to the n approaches 0. So 1 minus r to the n approaches 1. And we say that the series converges. As long as r is between minus 1 and 1, the series will converge. And in fact, it converges to this formula here. The sum of an infinite geometric series, given by s infinite, is t1 divided by 1 minus r, as long as r falls between minus 1 and 1. That's an important rule. For all other r values, a geometric series diverges. In our example at the top of the page, we had a, a series with r equals 1 half, because we were getting a half as much cash into that account every time. And so we could say that that series converged, and we could use this formula to calculate the value of the convergence. In fact, if you do that for the first example at the top of the page, you'll find $256 is the infinite sum. Interesting. Okay. In this, at the bottom of this page and at the start of the next page, we're asked, is this convergent or divergent and to find S infinite? So find the infinite convergence. I'd like you to pause and try all of these examples, and I'm going to take them up in two seconds. Okay, welcome back, starting on this, the bottom of this first page. The first series is divergent since R equals 3, so R is too big. In the second series, r is equal to negative a third. And so we could say that this is convergent. And in fact, plugging the formula in, you end up finding that s infinite, or the infinite sum, is 0 0.75. Let's flip to the next page. OK, continuing on the next page, uh, we find that for c, uh, r is negative 2. That's, I'm multiplying by negative 2 to get from one term to the next. So it's divergent, r is too small, it's below negative 1. In d, I have to multiply by negative 3 quarters every time, so r is negative 3 quarters. This is convergent, and plugging the formula in, you should get that the infinite sum is somewhere around 0 0.5714 and with rounding, of course. Now e is written in this strange format called sigma sum. It's just mentioned once in the pre previous lesson, so so we didn't really spend any time on this. This looks crazy, but all it's saying is that we take, we add up all the values starting from the first term when k is equal to 1. So the first term when k equals 1 is 3. The next term is 3 times 2 thirds, which is 2. The next term is then 2 times 2 thirds, which is 4 thirds, plus the next term, which would be Mm, times two-thirds gives me eight-ninths plus etc 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 so all this says is the first term is three and we multiply by two-thirds every time isn't that a nice way of just kind of summarizing things anyway it tells us right away then that r is two-thirds which means we're convergent and using the infinite sum theorem we end up with the infinite sum using the formula is exactly nine Here's our final example for this section. This one's a doozy. You may want to pause this for a moment and try it yourself, and I'll just remind you of two formulas. The circumference of a circle is 2 pi times radius r, and the area of a circle is pi times the radius r squared. Okay? Uh, try to think about this one and see if you can make any progress. And I'll take up the question in two seconds. Pause now. All right, welcome back. Uh, here's my initial thoughts in each question. So my initial thought here for part A is that the circumference of the first circle is 2 pi times r, which is 8. The circumference for the next circle is 2 pi times 4. The next circle is 2 pi times 2, etc. 
right? The, the radius is half every time. Okay, so in fact, our first term is 2 pi times 8, or 16 times pi. And our common ratio, r, is equal to 1 half. So plugging the formula for the infinite sum, I get our first term, 2 pi times 8, divided by 1 minus r. And in fact, if you plug that in, you'll get 100.53 centimeters, approximately, after rounding. In the second case, for the sum of all the areas, well, that's pi times r squared. So pi times 8 squared for the first area, pi times 4 squared for the second area, pi times 2 squared for the third area, etc. Let's rewrite that here. That's 64 times pi plus 4 squared. 16 times pi plus pi times 2 squared. That's 4 times pi plus dot, dot, dot. Now we see this is a geometric series with r equals 4. Or sorry, 1 quarter. It's 1 quarter the size each time. My bad. Okay, so if r is a quarter and our first term is 64 pi, then the infinite sum, which is, again, the formula t1 over 1 minus r, is 64 pi divided by 1 minus a quarter. Okay, uh, that will give us hmm, some kind of number. I'm going to type this in. And typing in, I get 268.08 centimeters squared. All right. That's it. That's all. Here's your homework. And that's it for, er, for geometric sequences and series.